Hello and welcome to Open Source Workplace video interview series. Uh, today, I'm very happy to introduce you to Kimberly Walken. Kimberly is a partner at Aaron Fox. She's been there for over 27 years. That's incredible. Well done, Kimberly. And she's also been named the leading DC real estate lawyer by the National Law Journal. Kimberly's been described as a tenacious negotiator with a keen business sense. So Kimberly, welcome today and thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me to be on. Uh, so Kimberly, obviously, you know, there's uh, law firms are very renowned for how they're set up, how they're structured in a workplace perspective, structure, you know, with offices and so on and so forth. How are you feeling today uh, not being able to go to the office and uh, are you enjoying working from home? It certainly made a big difference work-wise, whether I work at home or work in the office uh, because of the way our computer system set up. I have my work computer at home, my phone, my work phone rings at home. Um, if anything, now I'm more accessible to my clients because I'm always home. And so if the phone rings through my computer, I'm there to take the call. You know, what I do miss from working at home is, you know, I miss the interaction with my partners and the other people that aren't Fox. So I'll be looking forward to one day being able to go back there and work with them. But I've been pretty amazed that we've been able to have closings and people sign documents and have them notarized and how people have adopted um, in order to do transactions, you know, during this time. And, and sort of thinking that and taking that, running with that a little bit, uh, notarize obviously, and people need like wet signatures. Are people adapting and moving forward with electronic signatures on the back of that? Yes, they are. Um, Thank goodness for that. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. And that, um, you know, for my secretary, that's a notary through Zoom, I can have her watch a uh, client who's also on the screen notarize something and you know we're putting in every document that electronic signatures are acceptable um, and we're having closings with everything electronic and if they do need a wet signature then they'll just follow but so far it hasn't stopped any closing oh that's great that's great so uh, a couple of things that i really wanted to dig in to with you was obviously you know what we're going through at the moment it's no one's fault right that's what everyone's saying and that seems to be the spirit of what's going on but obviously there are many businesses that are struggling today and what we wanted to sort of talk about was options that people may have if they don't have the ability to pay rent so from a from a tenant's perspective what sort of options do tenants have if they can't pay rent well, the first thing I would say is look at your lease. A lot of people are hoping that the force majeure clause as a tenant will save them. And force majeure, sort of the concept, if something happens outside of your control, then you're excused from liability or for doing what you're supposed to do. Unfortunately, having now looked at lots and lots of force majeure jobs, clauses and leases, almost no one contemplated viruses, or pandemics. And then when you look at the case law, the states interpret, the courts interpret the force majeure law very narrowly. So if it doesn't say it, it doesn't count. And that means the tenants are out of luck. And some leases go so far as saying, even if the party's excused from force majeure, it doesn't mean it excuses your rent. So I think it's important first to know what your rights are under your leases because we were lucky uh, with one lease and that it did allow it and the force majeure did allow us to go to the landlord and say rent was abated, but that was a, an exception. There's another doctrine that people might hear about called the impossibility doctrine, that if it's impossible to do it, the court will just void the contract and you won't go forward. I don't think you're gonna find with landlord tenants that they're gonna apply the impossibility doctrine. They might do it in other contexts, but not that you couldn't pay rent rent so you didn't have the money. So then the next question I would look as a tenant if the lease doesn't help me is who has leverage? Does the landlord have your security deposit? Is it sizable? Does your landlord have a letter of credit? Is it sizable? Did you give them a guarantee and is that person credit worthy? If they are credit worthy then the landlord has leverage because they can go after this money. But then looking at it from the bigger picture is when this is over, does the landlord want your space? Are they gonna be able to fill it with another tenant quickly? Or is in both parties have incentives to work together? I would say that most landlords, but not everyone, would prefer to work with their tenants. 
but you need to be reasonable. So as a tenant, if you just send your form letter saying, I want you to bait my rent for six months, very few landlords are gonna pay attention to you and they'll probably get annoyed. If you come with a business plan that says, I'd like you to defer my rent, that means put it off for a few months, and then after such time on a date certain, I will start paying back my rent, and then you can discuss whether you're gonna pay interest, how much interest you're gonna pay, how are you gonna pay it back in six months, a year, over the term of the lease? A lot will depend on your business and what you're able to do. So if, I'm going, if I represent a tenant, or even if I represented a landlord and I'm looking at the letter, what I wanna know is, do you have a credible business plan that if I agree to defer this rent, you're gonna be able to pay me back? Are you at all sympathetic to my position as a landlord that I have to pay my lender? So that by you not paying my rent, I'm gonna have a hard time paying my lender. And so therefore I can't forgive you because my lender's not forgiving me. So if you come to your landlord and you say to them, I like to defer my rent till X, I'm willing to pay you interest. And here's my business plan going forward. And by the way, I, pay, I applied for the PPP loan and I applied for the Main Street Lending Program loans. And this is my plan to go forward. You're gonna have landlords that are much more receptive to you mm. than just a letter saying, sorry, I can't pay. Also, a number of the states have both loan and grant programs that you should be looking at because the money will run out quickly. But you know, not only do you have federal programs, you have state programs and you have county programs. And if you can't figure out how to find it, you know, get in touch with me. We can tell you what there is in your state or your county that you should be applying for. And these applications are pretty easy. Got it, got it. Now you mentioned Main Street loans. What, what actually are they? Um, the Main Street loans, there are two different types of facilities. It just came out. The applications aren't out yet, but the purpose of what I'm telling you is so that you can get prepared. There's a Main Street new loan facility, the emphasis on new with a new lender. And there's a Main Street expanded loan facility, which means that you're working with an existing lender. And the reason that these loans are really great from the borrowers, they're gonna provide a lot of liquidity. The interest rate is very low. The interest rate is the secured overnight financing rate, which right now is 1.2%, plus 2.5 to 4%. So I don't know when they're gonna decide what the interest rate is, but whatever the interest rate is, it's gonna be a lot lower than you can go out and get. The term of the loan is four years. What's wonderful is both interest and principal are deferred for a year so that you have the ability to take out these loans and have a while in some breather room before you have to pay them back. And again, it's a low interest rate. You can participate both in the PP low program and one of these other programs. The minimum loan amount is a million dollars. One of the things that's really nice is that the proceeds can be used to pay payroll expenses, ground lease expenses, real estate taxes, utilities, rent. I think you're gonna be able to use it to pay mortgage interest and maybe even regular scheduled principal payments. The regulations aren't out yet, so I can't say it definitively, but given that it's to help you sort of survive, I'm gonna, I'm guessing that you can do that. You cannot use it to refinance your existing loan or to repay uh, a line of credit. To be eligible, you can't have more than 10,000 employees or more than $2.5 billion in 2019 revenue. Now there's some nuances. So if it's something that you're interested in, you can get in touch with me or whatever lawyer you're used to working with and you can go over it. Um, sort of the difference is, is the Main Street new loan facility would be you'd be working with a new lender. You're not upsizing your existing loan. The maximum amount that you can take out under this is the lesser of $25 million or an amount is, that does not exceed all your outstanding debt as four times 2019 EBITDA. So that's still a sizable amount of money. If you decide to go with expanding your current debt, it's even more generous. The loan is the lesser of 150 million or 30% of your outstanding debt, or six times 2019 EBITDA. 
Now, the wonderful thing about these two loans is the new main loan, this is for the, the new one, not with your existing lender, it's an unsecured loan. So very few lenders are gonna give you an unsecured loan in this environment. The Main Street Expanded Loan Facility where you're working with your existing lender is that your existing lender has to share its collateral with, uh, for this new, this new loan amount. But the reasons your lender would be willing to work with you is that the government will buy 95% of the new loan amount. So the bank's taking very little risk and the lenders are gonna be earning fees. So that's why they would do it. Either way, sort of the catch is, you gotta get your lenders to work with you. Because if you currently have lenders and you have uh, SPE, special purpose, uh, entity covenants in your loan documents that says you can't take any other debt. Often you have something called a bad boy guarantee, and these are recourse guarantees. And if you violate the debt covenants and you take out additional debt without your lender's permission, then your existing loan can become a recourse loan. And that's a big deal because usually someone personally signed for it. So before you go and do these new loans, you want to work with your lender but your lenders are incentivized to work with you because uh, they get lender fees. It's very little risk to them. And they're providing liquidity to their borrowers, which will help you get down the road. And hopefully, therefore, you won't default because the lenders really would prefer to have strong borrowers than their collateral. So, and Kimberly, this, this loan, you said it's just being rolled out currently. It's not active just being rolled yet. Out. It's not, the application's not out yet. So really what you would be doing is figuring out, you know, what loans you have. You should be talking to your lender anyway, because hopefully you already applied for the PPP loan. Find out if they're going to be participating. Find out if they will consent for you to participate in this loan. And then have everything ready. So as soon as the application comes out, you know, that week you're applying. Sort of similar to the PPP loan, that mm -hmm. we're afraid that the money's going to run out. You don't want to be in a position that, you know, here this, this money is being offered at very low interest rate and you aren't one of the first people to grab it. And are you aware of any state restrictions or any uh, banking institutions that can't offer this? Not yet. Um, it's, they list who can, if you go to the Errant Fox website, we have mm -hmm. a number of articles on it and we list what type of lenders can lend. Um, but if you go, if it's a traditional commercial lender, you know, it looks like they would be eligible to lend and then you would call them up and see if they're participating in this program. That's great. That's great, Kimberly. And look, thank you. I, I appreciate you stepping in and sort of uh, pre presenting this because it is brand new and it is complex. And I appreciate you taking the time to, to actually present it to us today. And obviously we're going to do this on a go forward basis. So uh, we can follow up and should there be any changes, we can give us an update going forward. But uh, Kimberly, thank you. It's been great. Thank you. My pleasure.